about what it means to them since it's kind of this really kind of was the beginning of all grab some water We're all watching those numbers. <laughs> they should be going up now <laughs> with the number of people who signed up. All right, is Megan back? Um, I don't see her. Is, will she be the Chicago Women in Architecture window? Okay. I think. I'm back. <laughs> hey, Tara. What's up? Hey. Has the, okay, so I guess we can give uh, it another minute and then we'll get started. I think so. You have over 20 attendees now, and okay. people keep joining. They asked if we can change to gal uh, gallery view. Megan, I don't know if that's something you have to do. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Let me ask. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely gallery view on my side, so. It is on my side too. It's gallery view. So I see speaker uh, larger. I hear little ones. <laughs> Did that change? I see six. Yes. Yeah. yeah, is that? Well, we're the panelists, so we're going to view the screen differently than the attendees. Um, they said it hasn't changed, um, Negan. I'm not sure. Okay, let me bring Olivia. In. She can do that. I'm not sure.
Somebody says they can see all of us now. I think that was me again typing it in the oh. chat. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're at uh, 6.05, so we can get started. Um, hopefully, by the time we get to the uh, discussion at the end, they'll be able to view all six of us. I'm sorry, all five of us. And Negan, when she comes on at the end. Uh, but first and foremost, thank you everyone for attending and joining us tonight to talk about women pioneers of the built environment. We're extremely excited uh, to come together. All of us have a close connection and tie to history and better understanding how our built environment has come together today from pioneering women, and we want to present some of our findings to you. So first and foremost, um, I would like to start by introducing our panelists. Um, first with us today, we have Susan King. In 2007, Susan King became the first woman principal of HED, a national firm founded in 1908. Her, awarding, her award winning work includes buildings which integrate social, economic, and environmental responsibility with aesthetically appealing design solutions for underserved populations. S Susan is a past president of Chicago Ar Women in Architecture, CWA, and currently she is serving on two boards the Chicago Women in Architecture Foundation and the Illinois Housing Council. In 2013, she was the 18th woman in Illinois to be elevated to the National AIA College of Fellows. As an author of an essay, Only Girl Architect Lonely, which was published in the book, Chicago Architecture, Histories, Revisions, Alternatives, Susan often refers to herself as an accidental architectural historian. Thank you so much for joining us, Susan. Our next panelist I would like to introduce you to is Chris Herzell, Director of Facilities, Visitor Services, and Collections of Evanston His uh, History Center. Chris directs operations at the Evanston History Center from preservation to conservation the, uh, sorry, of the National Historic Landmark, Charles G. Dow's House, to curation of objects collection, um, to visitor education and facility usage. She also serves as a resident architectural historian, leading tours of the community, writing books and articles on Evanston history, and presenting informational talks on architecture and cultural landscape. landscape. Chris is a former vice chair of the Evanston His, uh, Preservation, Preservation Commission, excuse me, past president of the Francis Willard House Museum and has served on the boards of many, Evanston's, many of Evanston's non-for-profit organizations. She has a certificate in historic preservation from Northwestern University and a master's in science and historic preservation from the University of the Art Institute of Chicago. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Um, our next panelist is uh, Julia Barrett, please say your last name for me, Julia. Backwack. Backwack. Julia Backwack is a historic preservationist with a consultancy certified as a women business enterprise. She recently served as a lead historian of the North Lakeshore Drive Section 106 Historic Properties Inventory. Julia has been preserved, uh, sorry, Julia has been pursuing research in significant Chicago women for several years. She curated a permanent installation called Celebrating Chicago Women, a Chicago women's park and gardens. She recently also presented on the life and work of landscape arch architect uh, Gutrode Ku. And an international women's day at an international women's day symposium julia writes a monthly blog that includes essays about important women in history which you can find on her website www.jbarrup.com and then lastly um thank you so much julia for joining us i'm sorry if i butchered your last name um lisa de cure uh lisa is has been be curious. Sir. I'm the one that's used to getting my name butchered. <laughs> yes. Um, Lisa has been the director of advocacy for Landmarks Illinois since 2003. She was the director of the Chicago programs from 1994 to 1997. 
Lisa is on the front line of all calls for assistance on preservation issues from the public that manages major and manages major advocacy initiatives in the Chicagoland area. Lisa oversees the most endangered historic places in Illinois program and the other major initiatives such as Women Who Built Illinois database. She also worked previously for Heinz Interests in Detroit and the National Trust of Historic Preservation. She serves on the board of the Glessner House and on the Land Use and Housing Committee for the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, CMAP. She has also been twice included in the new city, Design 50, list of 50 people shaping Chicago design. Lisa received a B a BA in Arch and Architectural History from UCLA and an MS in Historic Preservation from the University of Pennsylvania. Again, these are our incredible panelists today that I'm so honored to be here with. And just a quick um, nitbit about myself. I am Tierra Hughes, a dedicated activist, educator, and advocate for underrepresented communities and voices of color. I serve on the National Organization of Minority Architects, NOMA, and the Turnley Pers uh, Persky House Board of Directors for the Society of Architectural Historians. Um, I am also one of nine commissioners for the Chicago Landmarks Commission here, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my foundation. I found it first 500 later on. Thank you. And now we will get into, we will start uh, today with a quick video, Pecha Kucha style from Lisa DeCure, DeCure, sorry. Um, and if I can share screen. Are you all able to see this? Oh, and actually I need to share with sound. Okay, here we go. Are you able to see this? Thumbs up? Okay, great. Yes, 2020 is the year of the pandemic, but it also marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote in 1920. And actually in 1913, Illinois Governor Dunn signed the Illinois Suffrage Act, giving Illinois women the right to vote for president. Now you'd think women would have been satisfied just with voting, but we were not. And it would be decades before diet soda, frozen dinners and women's lib came along, as well as commonly seeing women as architects. In fact, by 1958, only 1% of registered architects in the US were women. One of those women was Gertrude Lemp Kerbis, who after receiving her master's degree from IIT in 1954, worked for the powerhouse firms of CF Murphy and SOM. At Murphy, she designed the O'Hare Rotunda and at SOM, the Skokie Public Library, winning a 1962 AIA Honor Award. In 1967, Kerbis started her own firm and in a Chicago Tribune article featuring her indoor tennis club building in Highland Park, it was noted that Mrs. Don Kerbis was one of 36 women architects in Illinois, and the headline reads, she was working to improve our surroundings. In 2017, Landmarks Illinois included Kerbis's O'Hare Rotunda building on its most endangered historic places in Illinois list due to ongoing gate and terminal expansion plans for the airport, that left uncertainty about the rotunda's future. Advocating for the building's protection, it occurred to us that there is not one Chicago designated landmark designed by a woman. There are plenty of designated landmarks designed by all of these familiar faces, yet of the city's thousands of protected buildings, no woman has yet had that honor and we are seeking to change that. So like Georgia Louise Harris Brown, seen here in a sea of male colleagues at the office of Frank Kornacker and Associates in 1949, we are documenting women designed and built places in Illinois from 1879 to 1979, far too long unrecognized. We have so far surveyed the work of over 80 Illinois women, and this is an opportunity to introduce some of them to you. Seen here is architect Elizabeth Martini, 
who in a 1918 article noted she had been rejected by 90 firms due to her gender. She worked her way up from secretary to draftsperson and by 1914, after receiving her architecture license, was one of the earliest women to open her own firm. One of her best known buildings is St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Park Ridge, along with dozens of other residential and commercial designs. Next is Emma Kennett, who did not have an architecture degree, but designed and developed over 80 multi-unit residential buildings on Chicago's far north side and Evanston in the 1920s. By age 32, her Kennett Construction Company was churning out beautiful Tudor and Spanish Revival style buildings. Seen here is the 2300 block of West Farwell Avenue in West Rogers Park, where she designed and built six consecutive apartment buildings on the north side of the street. Interestingly, she worked with one of the first African American contractors in the city, Joseph Frederick Rousseau. Juliet Alice Peddle was born in Terre Haute, Indiana in 1899 and learned to draft at an early age from her father who taught machine design. She graduated in 1922 from University of Michigan and moved to Chicago, working for several firms, including Perkins Fellows and Hamilton. In 1935, Peddle moved back to Terre Haute and opened her own firm, practicing architecture for the next 30 years. Some commissions were in Illinois, including two residences in Marshall, Illinois, in the Oak Crest subdivision built in the late 1950s. Mary Ann Elizabeth Crawford was born in 1901 in Girard, Illinois. She attended University of Illinois and graduated from MIT in 1929 and received a master's in 1930. She worked as a stenographer for Holabird and Root and was a draftsperson for the Historic American Building Survey. By 1941, she received her architectural license and worked on several interiors and commercial and industrial commissions. Her most prominent work was designing the headquarters for the Lindbergh Engineering Company in Chicago, located at Hubbard and Western Avenues across from the Western Avenue Metro stop. Back to Georgia Louise Harris Brown, born in 1918, she studied with Mies van der Rohe at IIT in the summers of 42 and 43 while attending the University of Kansas, where she was the first African American woman to receive an architecture degree in 1944, specializing in structural calculations. She worked in Chicago from 1945 to 54, and for the firm of Frank Kornacker and Associates, was part of the structural teams for Mises 86880 North Lakeshore Drive, Keck and Keck's Prairie Court Apartments, and as seen here, Holzman Holzman Clay Camp and Taylor's Lunt Lake Apartments. Finally, Po Hu Xiao was born in Shanghai, receiving her architecture degree in Taiwan in 1941, and in 1958 came to Chicago to Lobel, Schlossman, and Bennett, where she spent the rest of her career and became a principal and shared owner. She specialized in hospital design and had a major role in designing West Suburban Medical Center in Oak Park, seen here. Colleague Don Hackle told me she was a remarkable woman who achieved recognition and respect well ahead of today's movement for gender equality within the profession. Many thanks to our sponsors, including AI. Thanks, Tiara. And uh, just to quickly explain to everyone the video that you just saw um, that is uh, the video that I recorded last year, which is why uh, it, it referenced 2020 uh, as part of the AIA Illinois conference. And uh, the opportunity here is to just give you a quick preview of the women that we have collected information on and continue to study as part of a database that will soon be on our Landmarks Illinois website for the public to be able to access. And um, we now have over 90 women in our database uh, that are not just architects, but also um, developers, engineers, landscape architects, and uh, also clients. And uh, the reason we've 
capture this time period of 1879 to 1979 is because we're really focused on those places where we can also seek uh, future landmark protection and National Register nomination for these buildings. So it's sort of trying to fit within the 50 year rule um, that will make that more possible. And I'm happy to answer more questions about it later on in the program. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Lisa will take it away at the beginning here for some quick comments. And Tiara, if you want to go to the next slide, um, this was just to make the point that um, we have some great supporters of our effort here, including Kim Kerbis, who of course is the daughter of Gertrude Kerbis, who has a very significant role in the founding of CWA. Um, and uh, Women in Restoration and Engineering are an organization that are very uh, supportive of our, of our efforts, as well as AIA Illinois and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, as you can see, our website at the top, landmarks.org. And then this is for you just to have my contact information, because one part of this project that we're doing is we're seeking input from others. So for those people who um, may have women that you want us to know about, that you think uh, don't have enough recognition today, um, they may or may not be one of our 90 so far. Uh, our database we hope to have up and running by May. Uh, but this is my contact information because I welcome information from anyone uh, going forward. And uh, thanks again, Tiara. Of course. Thank you so much. And now we'll transition here into uh, some profiles. And we'll start with Elizabeth Martini, presented by Susan. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm going to share a snapshot of what we know so far about Elizabeth Martini, or AKA Only Girl Architect Lonely. Next. Okay, she is, of course, the catalyst for us gathering tonight as 2021 uh, marks 100 years since she ran her ad in a local newspaper that resulted in one of the first groups of women in architecture organizing in the country. While this slide um, outlines very generally what we know of her life so far, it's worth mentioning that the ad she placed in a local newspaper simply said, Only Girl Architect Lonely wanted to meet all the women architects in Chicago to form a club. And this ad was actually picked up by other newspapers, and so essentially it was syndicated. Uh, Martini did indeed form a club, and it was initially called the Women's Architectural Drafting Club uh, because most of the women were not all licensed, but also because they included um, landscape architects and other related professions as well, not unlike CWA today. Uh, next. So when writing or researching one woman, especially in regards to the group uh, that we're talking about tonight, those practicing from the 1900s through the 1940s, you quickly learn of the others. Um, and it's mainly because of the groups they formed. For me, what I found myself doing was I kept keeping a side list of these other women and thinking someday someone should research these women further. Next. And then my opportunity to do that happened with the invitation to contribute an essay um, on women in architecture to the Chicago Architecture book. Uh, Martini's story ultimately became um, the title and the opener for my essay, but that essay really is a broader story about women organizing and the power of the collective. So next. And then this slide, um, I call it Martini by the numbers. Um, the rejection story that already was mentioned in the video uh, is actually really well, uh, well documented in multiple sources. And pretty much once Martini arrived in Chicago with her diploma in hand from Pratt, she was rejected by 90 firms and had to find another way into the drafting room. So this struggle made her determined to achieve licensure, uh, which she did in 1913. After being told by the head of the Civil Service Examination Department that, quote, you are throwing your money away, you won't pass. Um, out of the 86 who took the exam that day, Martini was the only woman who sat for it. And not only was she one of the 28 who passed, she had the third highest score. 
So the exam was important to her because she saw it as the pathway to opening her own business, which she did in 1914. And so uh, I think next with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know of her work. Um, the entry point for most women at this time into architecture was through residential commissions, and Martini was no different. Uh, this image was of a cottage design that she submitted, and it was published in the National, um, in National Real Estate Journal, but we actually don't know if it was built. So next. Oh, go ahead, next. There we go. Um, this house is in the Norwood Park neighborhood of Chicago, and it's important to me uh, because it was the first built example that I found during my search in the early 2000s when I was writing the essay. The house is yellow coated on the Chicago Landmark Survey, which means that it was too altered to be, um, it is too altered to be protected. While credited via the permit records to a Miss E.A. Martini, it made it on the survey as, quote, noteworthy due to its contributor to a potential historic district, not because it was designed by the woman who was the first to be a sole proprietor of an architectural practice in the city. So next. Um, and then I think this is mentioned in Lisa's video. Um, this was Martini's largest commission in Park Ridge, the St. Luke's Lutheran Church. Um, and actually in preparing for today, I was able to uncover a little more about this in that Martini was a member of this church's congregation. And she had first designed the pastor's residence, which is located by the, um, the Black Star on the lower right. Unfortunately, this residence was demolished but I'm eager now, once the pandemic is over, to see if the church has any photographs of this house because it was, a, it, it was apparently somewhat unusual for a parish. Um, Pastor Spangler intentionally did not want it to be a parsonage or even adjacent to the church. But nevertheless, it was often the site for weddings and baptisms. And go ahead and go next. We have, so um, I actually had the church professionally shot um, when I was writing the essay in the early 2000s. So um, this, go ahead and go next. Uh, both of these images I'm contributing to Lisa, to the Women Who Build Illinois um, project. Uh, and then uh, go next, one more. Um, so there's one more story from the church and it's about pay equity. Uh, Martini had strong opinions about this, as noted in this quote, but I also recently learned uh, about the unusual way in which she was paid for the church commission. So while $60 a month uh, may not seem like a lot in today's dollars, but it would have been around 900 bucks a month in her time. And she lived to be 98 years old. So I think that this, this you know, this income, regular income, may have helped her do some of the things she did uh, when she left Chicago and also perhaps helped her to retire, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So next. Um, so as you can see in this slide, there's still some more to be uncovered in her work um, after she left Illinois. Um, and while the work is not probably not iconic, um, and at first to some, it may not seem worthy of uncovering, I of course disagree. Um, I think that it's still early and we do not know enough yet to make that conclusion. So let's see, go next. Um, so far in Martini, I see that there is much more than just the ad and her ability to see the power in organizing. I also see a pioneer in regards to early adaptive reuse um, from the list from Michigan, from the project she did there. And then also even early sustainability in combining ideas about material reuse with building reuse in the Black River Mill project in Michigan. And even potentially in early senior living design as she designed her own home in the retirement community in Tennessee where she relocated in 1960. So that's what I've got on her, and I'm going to turn it over to Julia. Hi. Um, I still see you, Susan. <laughs> um, do you want to? I don't know who's controlling things, but can you guys see me? You can. Okay, great. Okay. So I am going to present um, Elizabeth Kimball Nedved. And um, so I will give you a, um, 
my story on Elizabeth Kimball Nedved. I'm actually trying, to, I forgot that I can't advance. So um, can you advance, Tiara? Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, I was doing research on a completely unrelated topic when I stumbled upon this Tribune article about husband and wife architects Rudolf and Elizabeth Nedved, who had just opened their own firm with an office in the Marquette building in 1926. I was intrigued, and so I did some research, and I wrote a blog essay about Elizabeth Kimball Nedved. And so now I would like to share with you uh, some of what I've learned. Uh, go ahead. Next. The oldest child of Ernest and Jesse Kimball, Elizabeth was born in Chicago in 1897. Her father owned the Kimball Cafe, a restaurant in the New York Life Building that was known for catering to the needs of office workers. Later recognized as one of the nation's first cafeterias, Kimball's restaurant was very successful. The family moved to the North Shore and Elizabeth graduated from New Trier High School. While there, she had a teacher who, who nurtured her talents as an artist, and Elizabeth decided to go to art school. She attended the Church School of Art in Chicago from 1916 to 1918, specializing in interior design. She then found a job as an interior decorator at Marshall Fields Department Store. Next. Displeased and bored with her position, she began studying at Northwestern University in Evanston. While there, she worked as a draftsman for architects Talmadge and Watson. The work must have led her to the decision to become an architect because she soon enrolled in the architecture program at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. After two years, she transferred to the Armour Institute in Chicago. As you probably know, the Armour Institute later became known as IIT. Next. According to the Chicago Tribune, when Elizabeth began her studies at the Armour Institute, she was given a drafting table right next to an affable and handsome young man named Rudolf Nedved. Having received his degree in 1921, Nedved was actually teaching at the Armour Institute when Elizabeth became a student there, and he may have been one of her instructors. The two fell in love. After he won the 1923 annual traveling scholarship competition, Elizabeth and her family decided to join him in Europe. She and Rudolf were married in London City Temple in September of 1923. And more than 30 Chicagoans traveled to Europe to attend their wedding. Next. Rudolf was elected as the president of the Chicago Architectural Club in 1926, and Elizabeth soon began teaching watercolor, um, a watercolor class for the club. The couple opened their own firm, Nedvel, Nedved and Kimball Architects, that same year. The following year, Elizabeth was the first woman admitted into the Chicago chapter of the AIA. Next. When Elizabeth and Rudolph established their firm in 1926, they called it Nedved and Kimball. One of their first major commissions was to design Sunset Point, a summer estate in Eagle River, Wisconsin, for Chicago businessman Monty J. Tennis. In October of 1928, Elizabeth gave birth to her first child, a son whom, whom they named Kimball Nedved. With the extra demands of parenthood, the couple must have decided that maintaining their own firm was too much. So they went into partnership with John Hamilton and William Fellows, who had recently dissolved the practice that they had shared with Dwight Perkins for about two decades. You'll notice that the name Kimball was dropped. Elizabeth was considered a silent partner. Fellows, uh, Hamilton Fellows and Nedved's work included the Avery Coonley School in Downers Grove, and the Wynadot High School in Kansas City. Next. Elizabeth was an active member of the Women's Architectural Club, which was the kind of outgrowth of the club that um, Martini had formed. In 1927, the club participated in the Chicago Women's World Fair, which was held in the old Coliseum building. Elizabeth Nedved and two other club members created a model kitchen for the fair. The display helped foster an awareness of the growing number of women in architecture uh, nationally, and it also promoted products such as the modern dishwasher that you see here. Next. 
1928, the Tribune ran a story called, This Woman Has Both a Career and a Husband, with a sidebar that had Elizabeth's headshot and the subtitle, Why Not? The article said, if you're looking for the perfect career girls, get married, suggesting that a woman could better succeed in a career if she did it alongside a husband in the same profession. Next. In 1928, the Nedveds purchased Frank Lloyd Wright's Glasner House in Glencoe. This would be their permanent home for the next 40 years. In 1931, Elizabeth became head of the Chicago Women's Architectural Club. This article explains the club was trying to become an organization that would serve all women architects across the country. They were hoping that Chicago would become the national headquarters for their expanded club. Unfortunately, the depression soon took a heavy toll on the profession and of course, things were becoming especially difficult for women architects. Next. By 1937, Hamilton Fellows and Nedved didn't have enough work, so Rudolph Nedved accepted a position with the U.S. Housing Authority in Washington, D.C. The family relocated to Virginia, and a few years later, Elizabeth accepted a position as a marine engineer for the U.S. Navy Bureau of Ships. The Nedveds returned to Glencoe in the late 1940s. It's unclear whether she was working professionally. However, in the 1950s, she was active in the North Shore Art League, and her son, Kimball Nedved, received an, uh, an architectural degree following in his parents' footsteps uh, from IIT. Elizabeth applied to have her AIA status reinstated in 1962. It was granted and she was made an emeritus member in 1969, only about a week before she died. Thank you. Thank you, and now we'll transition to Chris. To present Bertha. Great. Yeah. There we go. Thank you, Tara. Uh, so uh, I'm going to speak about Bertha Yerix Whitman, who I stumbled across uh, when we were doing some research on uh, for our house walk here at the Evanston History Center. She was born in Newego, Michigan in 1892. She was the middle of three girls, and her father died when she was young. So uh, she, Early on, she is this experience with her family of women as they struggle. I'm not quite ready for that, so don't go any further. Um, and uh, she got a degree in teaching from East Mich Eastern Michigan University, and she decided she didn't like teaching. And she thought about what she wanted to do, what she enjoyed, and she decided it was art and mathematics. Her grandfather was a carpenter, and she was very close to him, and she decided to go into architecture. And later she said, I really didn't understand what the full parameters of that field met, but she uh, decided to go in. So then the next slide. She applied to the University of Michigan. Uh, she was one of the very few women in the program at the time. In fact, maybe the first that was admitted. And in fact, Emil Lorch, who was the head of the program, and this is the building that she studied in, said, well, you're a woman and the law says we have to take you, but I'll tell you right now, we don't want you. Uh, so this is what she was up against when she came in. And I included the photograph at the bottom right of a classroom of the School of Architecture at that time, because I envision her walking into this classroom of men and them all looking up and saying, okay, what have you got? Uh, she said that later that she was really treated as an equal in the program and um, by the other students, although she wasn't allowed to go out on the field trips, it was not seemly for a woman. And she, uh, took a break in her studies in 1917 when the United States got into World War I and most of her fellow male students left to participate in the war. And she got a job as the first woman draftsman for Dodge Brothers, which is the photograph on the lower left of one of their assembly lines about that time, um, drafting for them during the war and then returned to the University of Michigan after the war and uh, was the first woman to graduate from the School of Architecture in 1920. And we'll talk about how she got her license later on. Uh, the next slide, Tiara. Uh, while she was at University of Michigan, I, she began to explore uh, organizing women. And she joined was one of the founding members of the T-Square Society. And these are, uh, this is a photograph of them. There's Bertha in the back. Um, and it taught her, and uh, something that I think she probably learned early on, the value of organizing women in the field that was dominated primarily by men. 
Next slide. Uh, when she graduated, um, actually her nemesis, Lorch, suggested that she go to Chicago to look for a job. Uh, and she did. She was uh, interviewed and declined by a number of architectural firms. She doesn't name them, uh, but she was accepted at Perkins Fellows in Hamilton, and she was very happy there. Uh, she writes about it extensively in her memoirs. Uh, she said it was like one big family. Um, she did say that she, her desk was situated away from the rest of the, the men in the office, and this beautiful uh, monograph that Perkins Fellows in Hamilton published shows the layout of the drafting floor and uh, she describes that her desk was over by the stairs and near the balcony where she enjoyed planting the flower uh, boxes. So I imagine that there she was probably over there in the upper right hand corner. Um, this monograph also was published in 1925 and it credits all the people who worked on the um, buildings that are described therein and it names Bertha as one of the contributors. She stayed there for a number of years. Her first child was born uh, and then her second. And uh, she said she was treated by an equal uh, by, uh, by the men in the office insofar as she was uh, worked alongside the engineers. She went out uh, in the field and uh, said she walked the trusses at the Evanston Township High School auditoriums. They were designing it. And um, her fellow, uh, she worked there with Juliet Petal. And Petal was getting her uh, license and suggested that Bertha do it as well, which she did. She said she was pregnant with her second child, but she studied uh, very hard and got uh, the license in, in 1926. Um, while she was there, she also responded to Elizabeth Martini's invitation and joined the Women's Architectural Drafting Club and then uh, later the, the Women's Architectural Club. Uh, she married in 1921. Uh, and they moved to Evanston. She said Dwight Perkins lived in Evanston. She had some experience uh, up there that she didn't design the house that they lived in, uh, but they moved up there in 1924. So next slide. Uh, well, this is one of her first commissions. Uh, the part of Evanston they lived in and she lived nearby uh, was just being developed and just been annexed and uh, developers had these ads in the newspapers come on out. Um, and buy a, a lot, and they were selling them in groups of two to four. And uh, John Strong, which was a local builder and developer in Evanston, bought these four lots, um, and she designed these four houses in a row. Kind of hard to get them all in. I got it from both angles. Uh, and I really think this was uh, some of her strongest work. She's uh, married, she has the two children, but she's doing this work for small local Evanston developers. And um, these are the good years for her. Next. Next slide, Tiara. Uh, the, uh, she won an award for uh, a house. Um, it's a little unclear which house it was. It appears it's different addresses. It was either. And I sense that uh, the 2710 pin in the upper left-hand corner was it, um, because she, her picture's in front of it there. But um, there's also some uh, no, anecdotal evidence that it might have been the second house on the right for uh, Otto Schultz. Uh, in 1931, it was awarded in 1931. It was or awarded by a contractor's association. And much of her work, as I said, was from small local developers and contractors. Uh, Lawrence, uh, the, the house on the left, he was a, a decorator, a house decorator. So this is where she got her contacts in, in the community of which she was very much a part. The next slide. Um, during the when the depression came along her husband unfortunately left the family and she was um, forced to go out and get other work um, so she got a job uh, working for the state of illinois and uh, did some work for them but she's continuing to develop her business on the side in evanston this article on the left ran in the in 1973 when there was a the retrospective of her work in Evanston. Uh, again, here's an example of uh, a house that she did for another local developer. She prided herself on her residential architecture. It was primarily what she did. She prided herself with getting to know people, some of the people who were going to live in her houses. She prided herself on efficient layouts, particularly in the kitchen. That's why I showed an example of it here. Next slide. Uh, these are, this is a slide of some of the uh, work that she did from the 1920s and 30s. 
uh, through the, the, the 1940s and 50s. Uh, the work in the, after the war, the buildings were smaller, the lots were smaller, the budgets were smaller. So the center house there in 1947 is an example of some of the work she did then. She did some small commercial buildings, as you can see uh, at, uh, at the Hartsville, the Harrison Street um, building above. And the last slide, Tiara. So uh, in conclusion, uh, one of the things she said was, all my life, I've done things people said I can't do. And also in her uh, obituary, she was quoted as saying, well, I'm no Frank Lloyd Wright, but I enjoy what I do. And I enjoy showing men that women are just as good as whatever, uh, as they are at whatever we do. Um, and that concludes my coverage on Bertha. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and I think, you know, I, I just pause here for a second and say that there is a running theme with all of these ladies of being told they can't do something and continuously proving them wrong. And it's, it's such an honor for all of us to discover these stories and speak about them today. Um, so for the presentation portion, we'll just end here with uh, Beverly Lorraine Green. She's the first African American um, and Black licensed architect uh, in the country. And I'll speak a little bit, a little bit more about her. Um, Beverly happens to be uh, a Chicago native. She was born to, as the only child to a James and Vera Green in 1915. Her dad was a lawyer and her mom was a housewife, so she had a pretty comfortable upbringing. Despite the odds being stacked against her, Green set her sights high. She became the first African-American woman to study architecture at the University of Illinois, where she received a bachelor's degree in architectural engineering in 1936 and an MS in city planning a year later. Green carried herself with a level head, focused and determined to make her mark um, in the built environment. Being a minority in race and gender didn't frustrate her, but instead fueled her. It propelled her. Uh, Green kept going. In December of 1942, she became a registered architect for the state of Illinois at age 27. The Chicago Housing Authority hired her, and in return, she broke the racial and gender glass ceiling. Chicago was still a rough crowd, though. The mainstream press at large notoriously ignored African-American architects and their contributions. Green, faced with the hard truth about her hometown, decided to pack her things up and relocate. She ended up moving to New York City. Her next prospect, the development of Manhattan's Stuyvesant town, a private housing complex. She was hesitant because this was a complex that did not welcome Blacks at the time. You know, they had a no Negro policy. And despite all of that, she was um, chosen and she accepted the position. However, after just a few days, Green left and accepted a scholarship to study city planning at Columbia University. This is another example of how Black people have to go above and beyond to essentially uh, prove themselves and be overachievers in our professions and receive parts of or small recognition for our accomplishments. She ended up working with, during her career, extremely notable firms and architects um, from all over. And, uh, you know, Edward, Darrell Stone is one of them. Marcel Brewer is another. Um, Isidore Rosenfield was another firm that focused on um, healthcare that she happened to work with for some time as well. And then, of course, the Chicago Housing Authority I mentioned previously. And then here are some examples of projects that she got to work on in her time, um, most notably the United Headquarters in Paris. Um, United Nations headquarters in Paris that uh, finished a year after she passed away. Um, and then that chapel that's in the middle at the top was where her memorial service was held, um, which was in the building that she designed, which is just, again, gives me chills when I read about that. And then here's a quick map showing Beverly's footprint today. Um, a lot of those buildings that you saw on the last screen uh, is still standing and she still has a footprint on the built environment 
far beyond her years. Um, and then transitioning a little bit into, again, I mentioned FIRST 500 earlier, I'll wrap this up quickly. It is a national research endeavor that's focused on highlighting and raising awareness about African-American and black women architects and their contributions to the built environment. You know, our goal is to infinitely increase our representation to better reflect the environments that we live, work and play. And this is so important because we just celebrated having 500 black women architects living in the US last October. October of 2020, like a couple months ago. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, black women right now make up less than 1% of the industry. So if you know a black woman that's studying architecture or in the field and isn't licensed, please support her and nudge her. And then of course, this is a full circle moment for me because uh, Beverly Green was also an activist. Um, she was a leader in the organization for um, basically Negro rights in architecture. And um, that is equivalent to NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects that I serve on the national board for today. And then also the work that I do with First 500, traveling around the country, making sure people understand their stories and understand the direction we need to head in as an industry is so important. And again, that's a full circle moment for me because I'm, I'm channeling Beverly. You can see this picture of me with her uh, when I do my work around the country. Thank you. And so with that, we will transition into um, our discussion portion of the conversation tonight, um, which again, and I'm sure you ladies feel the same way of just being honored to uh, stumble across these stories or intentionally research these stories and understand the trailblazers that have paved the paths for us. And so I want to start by, you know, having us speak on the importance of telling these stories and research digging and discoveries and, you know, how, how that's shaped us and the stories that we've told today. And I can start that question with Susan. Okay. Uh, okay. So, well, I, I, I I'll say two things. Um, for me, it started as a young professional. Um, I didn't learn about any women architects when I was in, in college. Um, and when I got out, um, my class maybe had, um, I think it might, not maybe, I think there were 10 of us in a class of like a hundred, but I didn't really realize, um, what that meant uh, when you know once once I got out into the field, um, and it took a little while, but I you know started to look around and realize I didn't have my girlfriends <laughs> anymore, mm -hmm. and so it's actually through CWA it was you know that was one of the things that drew me to it was I wanted to meet you know meet other women because I a large part of my younger career I was in a smaller firm and and um, you know I was like one of two women most of the time I was there, so that's where it, it sort of started for me through CWA and the Muse and this idea that maybe I could research historic women. And I didn't realize, like I started with Eileen Gray and I see like in the audience, some people who wrote things with me are here. So that's really cool. So shout out uh, to you guys. But um, I didn't realize what I was gonna find, you know, that when we started to find the Elizabeth Martini story and then these other women. And so I'm very, very excited tonight that more research has been done on that side list um, that I used to keep, or maybe I'm still keeping it, I don't know. But I, I will also, because I know some, everybody else um, should contribute too, I do want to share um, this quote with you guys, because I just, I'm a big Re Rebecca Solnit fan. I don't know if anybody else reads her, but um, I just started one of her books this very week, and it, her, her the book is called, um, she's the author of uh, Men, Explain, Men Explain Things to Me, you haven't read it read it it's a collection of her essays she's an amazing writer however the book i'm reading now is the mother of all questions and um she says and she talks a lot about our stories and so it was just a weird thing mm -hmm. this week that i came across this like two nights ago but she says liberation is always in part a storytelling process breaking stories breaking silences making new stories a free person tells her own story. A valued person lives in a society in which her story has a place. 
So I'll end on that. It's like, and that just, it's, yeah, it's just weird to me that I read that like two nights ago. I'm like, oh my God, I got to work this into the q and So thanks for queuing me up for that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, that's great. And I think something that we do often deal with as women is, um, I think current terms is, is mansplaining or our voices aren't, you know, contributing to the conversation equally or being heard. And so um, that is something, again, that was a silver lining in all of the women's stories that we presented. And so I guess I'll, I'll ask, I'll p- pivot over to Julia to speak a little bit more to the importance of telling these stories for women today. Well, um, yeah, and I, I should also just sort of uh, throw it back to, to Lisa because um, I think what Landmarks Illinois is doing is, is so important. Um, I, as a historian, I've always been really interested just in biographies. So when I research buildings, I often try to figure out who lived there, uh, in addition to who the developer and the architect was. Um, and so I just, I'm feeling that in the last five or 10 years, um, that the uh, research materials that you can find so much more. Um, and so that's why I think this is kind of exciting that Lisa's project that it's almost kind of like a crowdsourcing project that we can all kind of go out and find stuff and uncover things. Um, we, Lisa and I worked recently on a project with the National Trust where we were um, doing profiles of women who contributed to mid-century design. And I studied uh, um, a, a several landscape architects. And one of the things that I realized was that um, women's name changing. Uh, I, I was studying one woman landscape architect whose name changed like three times um, because of marriages and divorces and remarriages. And, and, um, and so I realized that it's also just, it can be difficult you can lose the thread. It's much more difficult to try to follow the, the names. So um, uh, I love the detective work. And um, you know I always sort of uh, consider myself a resource. So if people are doing this kind of work or um, interested in any help, you know, shoot me an email. I, I uh, love finding out more. Thank you. Yes, for sure. And Lisa, did you want to chime in on uh, some of the work you've done together and this this new portal that you're uh, creating for women history. Sure. Um, I, I mean, like I said in the video, you know, what really prompted this for me was including Gertrude Kerbis's O'Hare Rotunda on our most endangered list back in 2017. It's not as if pre-2017, we as an organization didn't care about the work of women. It's just it, it kind of, it was like a light bulb going off for me at that time, trying to advocate for that building that, um, you know, as we've done this work as an organization for 50 years, and that's why I have this funky vintage um, 1970s logo behind me. If anyone is wondering, it's our original Landmarks Illinois logo. You know, for almost 50 years, all the architecture we've been advocating to protect has been pretty much male designed. and. Um, and that as we were talking about, can we get the O'Hare uh, Rotunda landmarked or even listed in the National Register of Historic Places, I, I started looking at the inventory of what's been protected in Chicago of women designed places and the number was zero. And that was just astonishing <laughs> to me um, that here we are now and that we're still in that um, situation of being so underrepresented. And so, um, you know, this is a really exciting initiative for us because it's not only, I loved the word Julia said, crowdsourcing. It's, It's not only creating a database where everyone can continue to contribute to it above and beyond, um, the women that we've already collected information on. Um, but, as a historic preservation advocacy organization, and Tiara, you have a very important role in the Commission on Chicago Landmarks, as we know, our effort's gonna be to try to get some of these places landmarked and protected. And um, so not only in Chicago, but here, you know, Chris is showing us places in Evanston and, uh, you know, Susan is showing us Martini's work in Park Ridge. And these are communities with historic preservation ordinances 
as Chris knows, she served on the Historic Preservation Commission in Evanston. And we need to make sure these commissions step up too and really push the designation and protection of these women designed places. Um, and not only designed, again, I wanna make the point that our, well, CWA has a mission that's focused on architecture. Our database is not only women architects, but women designers in landscape design and interior design and engineering and, and, uh, and developers and builders too, because as we know, especially with someone like Gertrude Kerbis and many other of these women, they became developers as well because that's how they had to keep their work relevant. If they weren't going to be hired by men, they had to become their own finance, you know, finance their own projects sometimes and, and find investors and, uh, and move beyond, uh, you know, just waiting for the, for the client. They became their own client too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, for me finding stories for, for first 500, um, is is it's a task <laughs> i mean there's with you know we saw in the presentations that there were so many publications and articles from tribune and and others that supported these women and that's not the case uh for for black women and their contributions to the built environment and so um, it's a task for all of us to work together, um, crowdsourcing to julia's point and you know just having these open ended um places where everyone can pull into is is really what it's going to take for all of us to to get there and chris i'll i'll end with you on this question um about you know seeking out the stories and speaking about the importance of those stories when you find them one of the things that struck me as i was listening to that is bertha had such a you know she all most all of her work was in evanston and so a lot of times because of that because it is in chicago proper and because it was so localized the story does get lost uh, and when i saw those articles that there was this retrospective in the 70s i thought well so i'm not discovering her she's been discovered and then she got lost again so i think it's important to keep you know keep them in the forefront um, and as Julia said, you know, when uh, we do histories of, of buildings, we do the architects and the developers, um, which I just thought of a great developer in Evanston that I should pass along to you, but um, woman. Um, we, we also, when we tell the histories of the people who lived in there, I, traditionally, historically, uh, it, the house will be referred to by the man's name who commissioned it. So it'll be the James B. Irving house. And so we're making a real effort here at the History Center. We're also um, the, the headquarters for the Evanston Women's History Project. And so uh, we're always thinking we've got to always, always tell the woman's story when we're telling the story, not leave that part out of it. And um, I've taken to looking in the directories, uh, looking on census records, finding the wife's name and renaming the house, the, you know, um, Chris and Tom house, because um, it needs to have the woman's name in the title as well. I mean, we get lost in so many ways. Um, so we do, it's a, we have, it's a continual uh, struggle to keep us in the forefront. So yes. never, never, never stop. Yes, I love that that intentionality of just finding who the wife was and finding who the, the woman contributor was and making sure that her voice is amplified as well as his, right? Um, I guess we can we can transition here and speak a little bit more into uh, that parallel that women deal with of having careers and personal lives, right? A lot of us um, during those talks and presentations and all of you, um, we have families and we have careers. And so um, a lot of these women were able to balance that. And some of them had to stop at some points to start their families and their careers. And so if we want to speak uh, a little bit to that as well, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about, um, you know, uh, Martini becoming a, I'm sorry, not Martini, Nevet becoming a silent partner um, in the front. Like that is so bizarre to me. Um, and I know that was around the time that she started having children and stuff and focusing on her family. So uh, Julia, do you want to speak a little bit more to, to that? Right. Yeah. And when we, when um, the five of us kind of got together and we were just 
sort of chatting about our different <laughs> women and and how interesting it is. And then also, you know, Lisa and I just had this experience where we were also looking at another large group of women from history and we realized that their lives kind of ran the gamut, um, especially from the mid-century women it just turned out that a couple of them were like young widows as well. And so, you know, that there were women like Martini who never married and, and probably felt that she kind of had to make that decision to have this kind of career. And then I thought it was hysterical in my um, finding that Tribune article that, that said, you know, girls, if you want a career, the best thing to do is find a man with that career. You know, it's just <laughs> kind of hysterical. And then um, Chris's woman, Bertha, I mean, her husband ran off on her and she had small children. She was already kind of supporting them. Um, so he may have been he may have been resenting her because of that. So looking at these kind of life issues and trying to um, find out, you know, a little more about the personal lives, I think that it really resonates with us because we know that, you know, I think, yeah, um, you know, even the uh, trying to study people of color, like one of the one of the things I find really fascinating about studying um, African American people's lives is that like, any people that are like up against extra challenges, you know, the the perseverance in that kind of like what it takes to succeed makes for, of course, like a fascinating story. Um, I was really curious about what happened to um, uh, Elizabeth Nedved and why she sort of kind of dropped off the, um, you know, like there's just sort of a, a blank period. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned about her name and that, you know, obviously she was really proud of her name, of her of her maiden name, because they gave it to her son and the firm was called um, Nedved and Kimball. But one really interesting thing, I'm always just like talking to people and just trying to find out whatever I can find out about the person I'm studying. And uh, many um, of us, and, and probably you know, Tim Samuelson, a cultural historian for Chicago. and. Um, he was studying the prairie architects from when he was a, pretty much of a young boy. And so he told me because they owned the Glasner house, I, I'm thinking he may have been like a young teenager, took, I, I don't know, probably the Northwestern train out to um, Glencoe so that he could talk to the Nedveds and ask them about, um, about Wright and about um, uh, Barry Byrne and Perkins and Fellows. And, um, and so I said to him, like, well, did you talk to them about their career? And he said, I wasn't really thinking about that. And I said, oh, I was just wondering because she kind of seems to have this gap in her career. And he said, oh, well, I think that she did have a child with special needs. Mm -hmm. And so, because you never hear about the second child. So anyway, I'm rambling a little bit, but I think this these stories of really trying to get the full picture, especially for a woman who is in, in a, especially in history, trying to balance family and career um, kind of rounds up the story and helps us understand mm -hmm. all that they were up against. And, you know, we're still having problems trying to do it all. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That, um, Chris, did you have something to add? Uh, no, I just, I appreciate that Julia pointed out how much I think Bertha did struggle with her um, keeping everything going with the family and um, and I appreciate that she kept her uh, architectural business going on the side even though she had this full-time job in another field which she did kind of twist to um, eventually ended up doing office remodels and things for the state of Illinois so mm -hmm. she um, she was always in there pitching but I feel like I, I feel her struggle mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely and I guess that this this parallels with um, with us today, with women practicing today, uh, whether you're his, a historian or an, an architect. Um, you know, we deal with uh, a lot of still inequities and under uh, reckon, you know, being under recognized, excuse me, um, in the industry today. And so I guess I want to pivot a little bit to talk to talk a little bit about that. Um, Susan, can you speak to some of these parallels that we experience oh. today as women in the industry? Yeah, before I do that, though, I wanna, um, I'll just add on a little bit to the end of the question because, um, you, I mean, as you mentioned and noticed, I mean, Elizabeth Martini never got married, which is, I, know, I guess that was unusual, a little bit unusual. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, and I don't know if you picked up on uh, some of the detail 
of the writing of my slides, but um, she, you know, uh, this, when I mentioned the Black River Mill project or uh, whatever, um, she bought that building and she relocated it, then she made it into her own house. And that's what I was sort of getting at when I said, maybe that income from the church <laughs> that she was getting on a regular, like some of the things she did made me think, um, like in, initially I would think, oh, maybe she's kind of like Eileen Gray, where her family had, you know, she came up from a little bit of wealth and that allowed her, you know, to go to college and things like that. But that didn't seem to be the case with Martini because she was a, her, her father was a pastor. So there's no indication that that family, you know, that she came from a family of needs or whatever that, and so she was very, it, it seems like she was very much about supporting herself all mm -hmm. the way through her life and not depending on, on anyone. So, you know, whether or not that played into her, you know, her decision not to have kids or not to marry, you know, we don't know, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of interesting. So then I guess we can pick up from there and pay equity <laughs> that we're all, uh, you know, we're, we're all still, you know, it's always just like, really, we're still fighting the same a lot of these same issues, you know, mm -hmm. yes, there's, there's been progress, certainly. And that was also part of why I, I still, um, initially when I, I went to, um, to research these women, um, I know like Pam Hill, I know is here tonight. Yay. Hi, Pam. And Melissa Bogus, And I'm probably going to miss somebody who, who wrote these women with me, but we thought at first we thought, oh, we're going to get, um, these stories are going to be too depressing to us. So back then, what we did, we thought we'd, we'd pair, you know, we'd do these little articles where we'd take a historic woman and a, a current woman so that we could feel more like, to see the progress that has been made. But at the same time, it feels too slow, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So I don't know if somebody else wants to add on to that. So there there think, was a question in the chat. And I, I don't, I think maybe Lisa might know the answer. It was asking if Dubin, Dubin, Matusumi, and Black hired any African American women. I don't even know if they had any women uh, architects working for them. But I was, I was going to pivot that question back yeah. to Julia because I yeah. know. Not that I know of. I mean, especially back then. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Following Beverly, I think it might have been a while before there were. Uh, a, a, a number of other uh, African American women practicing. In well, Chicago. Georgia Louise Harris Brown is the second, and and you know, I mean, that's really and Norma Clark is the third. Yes, and it's and it's hard to not and I, and Tiara, I need you to give me more information on her when you have the chance because um, at this point in our database, like I said, where we have just over ninety women, um, we only have Beverly and Georgia. Um, in terms of, again, finding women who um, were involved in architecture that resulted in built places in Illinois. Um, we're assuming Beverly uh, had a hand in, you know, helping with the design and the actual outcome of places that were built by CHA, but even CHA's um, archives are terrible <laughs> with her, the, the period of her history with the agency. Um, one of my colleagues, Erica Rogero, who's uh, with the firm McGuire Agleski, has been a great partner to me in doing research, and she has tried her best with CHA, and they just do not have the information we need on, on Beverly. And um, interestingly, like Beverly, Georgia ultimately uh, also left Illinois for where she thought she could achieve her career in a better place and in another country, in fact. Um, so, you know, this continues to be a problem, sort of like Julia said, in terms of women's names changing too, it is just this continual detective work, but we just have the fact that a lot of firms and a lot of agencies just didn't even think it was worthy of retaining records and information on the women that were in their ranks. So mm -hmm. um, who knows if there was ever a woman at Dubin, Dubin, Black and Matusame that, that you know may have worked there even as a drafts person, and we have no way of knowing. Well, um, one, one thing that I would love to advocate for, especially with through a group like CWA, one really fantastic resource, which we don't have anymore, sadly, 
is, you know, the Art Institute did those fantastic interviews of older living architects, oh, world world architects. Yes, and they're all, you know, you can download them, you can listen to them as transcripts, or you can, I like to read them. Um, so you can download, you know, and, and so a lot of times, like, um, I have found information about a woman from an interview of another, of a male architect, that project ended, you know, they did a few in the early 2000s and it's been ended since then. And we have lost, we've lost practitioners who have died that were never interviewed because the Art Institute didn't have the funding anymore. And so that, I think this is really a tragedy. I mean, it's for, you know, people like us who do this kind of work, you know, all the time, it is a treasure trove of information. We're, it's, we're not gonna have it for the next generation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really that's awful. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, just that's interesting that you raise it. So that was the oral history project. If people don't don't know, Betty Blum was the the, the historian, I guess, on that. But it's uh, I kind of forgot about this. But CWA, we did get a grant, and we did three, but they were oral, um, like oral history. It was it was building on that idea, but making it oral or whatever. And so Gertrude Curvis was one of them, and Carol Ross Barney, and I'm forgetting who the third one was. Somebody in the audience might remember. Um, I want to say maybe it was Cynthia Weiss. We got we got a little bit of money to do those three, and but that was like 2010. I don't know. I, it was a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, but oh, yeah. which is a good I, point, Julia, too, from the standpoint that um, you know, like the the way I found more information about Po Hu Chow was by talking to Don Hackle. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I didn't have a long conversation with Don Hackle about right. her period at Lobel Schlossman. Well, and I was just thinking Art Dubin was such a nice, was such a nice guy. Like, I wish I would have known to ask Art Dubin, you know, and it, mm -hmm. just like Tim Samuelson going to the Nedbeds and not thinking to ask about them, you know, I didn't know, when I knew Art Dubin, I didn't know to ask him, you know, I was asking him about Jens Jensen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, so that's a good, you know, for all the for all the the women that are guests on this um, for this talk today, you know, if any of you know any elders in the architecture community, men or women, um, you know, we'd urge you to ask them about were there women that worked in their firms, um, you know, pre nineteen. Uh, you know, 80s, I mean, because really most of us know the women that have been working in firms in Chicago from the 80s onward. You know, we really need to, it is these women that we need to unearth from before that time. And um, to your point, we have a lot of architects still in our community who are in their 80s and uh, unfortunately less in their 90s. But, you know, we, we need those stories. And sometimes it's just, it's just you have to ask. That's the only way you can get the Yeah, I, I guess too, I, and you're kind of answering one of the questions in the chat, um, which is what can people do today? And I love that sort of interview and just conversational learning of knowledge. Um, the, the Women Built Project right now, uh, Lisa, is there a portal open that people can submit into or what's the, what's the, the route for that? The email at this point. <laughs> <laughs> is there, okay, okay. <laughs> No, that sounds good. I, I'll well, also we just will, we will. Uh, we're hoping that in May we're going to finally have this up on our website, and everyone will start being able to go through the um, database and seeing who we have and who we don't have. And even for people we do have, you'll eventually see that there's still a lot of information we need to collect on the women. That even though we have their name and some basic information, we're missing a lot of you know quality information on their careers and that's what we'll be looking at. Yes. Well, and funny. I oh, I sorry. also will I'll take a moment here as well to drop a plug and just say that First 500's website and database is also being developed right now and it should be launched uh, late summer. So um, there will be a form and, and a whole process that you can go in to fill in information about black uh, women architects so that we can start archiving their accomplishments as well. Did you have something to add, Julia? Oh, I was just gonna say that, um, Chris, I mean, I've always been looking for more um, archives about Perkins Fellows and Hamilton because they were known as the go-to firm for women architects for back in the day, you know, for, for the 20s and the 30s. And, um, 
And so I noticed, I thought, you know, tomorrow, as soon as I, I'm going to go back to that slide, I noticed there were two names on there, like somebody channel with that I didn't know. So I'm like, ah, and I'm always trying to beat Lisa to the punch because I like to be the one to tell her, hey, I found another one. So, but if people have ideas, if you stumble across something, I mean, email us because we're all, you know, we're always doing research. And um, of course, it's, I have a bad habit of dropping what I'm supposed to be working on and doing something else. So, um, you know, if there's some threads, we will try to follow them. Yeah. And we also need to do a, a better job at documenting women that are still alive and practicing today and younger folks, because those are the times that you can get the accuracy in the stories, right? When they're living and well and, and can tell those. But I'll transition here. I know we only have 10 minutes left um, into some audience questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, and we can start with you, Chris. Uh, who is your um, favorite current pioneering woman? And what about her work resonates with you? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm, you know, deeply embroiled in uh, a project right now, which is um, the Prayer School in Evanston. We're documenting that, and we're going to put it forward. So I've been um, reading a lot about Marion Manny Griffin, even though she didn't live in Evanston. She one of her buildings was down in Evanston, and it was um, sadly demolished. Um, <clears throat> but also her and her relationships and her relationship with Perkins. And I think that's why Perkins Fellows and Hamilton was, you know, so welcoming. Um, and uh, just the, the work that uh, the, the effort that she had to make to, um, to be heard. And of course, once she married, she sort of sublimated her own career to that of her husband's. But um, I just, I'm, a prairie school uh, lover and I've been very fascinated by by her um, her forays into the field yes yes that's uh, Susan did you want to add so uh, so the question is who is my favorite current pioneering woman? current uh, yes or, live or historic today? if you want to do historic that's fine too oh boy um, yeah I guess I'll do his well I don't know <laughs> There's too many. It's hard to pick a favorite. Um, I, I mentioned Eileen Gray earlier. I think she was one of the ones that I wrote about first when for the for Chicago Women in Architecture, and I still really love her work. And um, I managed to sort of pseudo break into her E1027 house in France before mm -hmm. it got when it was pretty much abandoned, um, which was very sad to see it like that. And so I'm actually eager to go back there to see it now that it's it's been restored. Um, and then in terms of pioneering women today, um, you know, locally, um, I, don't, I don't think Carol Rossborn is here tonight, but I've always admired Carol's work. Um, I think she's, luck, you know, it's inspirational to see that she's been really well <laughs> I think she's been really well documented, so that's good. And then um, I'm also a big fan of Gertrude Kerbis. I was um, through CWA. I got to know her before she passed away, and um, I've been an advocate for Lisa to somehow figure out how can we landmark that O'Hare thing. And I, I had the same concern when the big competition was going on. I would, the first thing I was like, I hope they're not touching that, you know, her terminal. And luckily, they were not. It's kind of scary. So. Yes, yes. Um, love, love me some Car Carol Rossbrunny as well. She she got the SHA, um, sorry, S H S A H um, Historian Award, Lifetime Award last year, and I got to attend the year before. Sorry, 2019, uh, when things were in person, and I got to attend and and celebrate with her. And she's she's doing amazing work. She her her team just won Auburn Gresham uh, in Best Southwest. Uh, community master planning and building for that. So she's, I, I love her. <laughs> um, Julia, do you have um, anyone that you would like to add that's a current pioneer? Well, I want to make a shout out to Carol Ross Barney too, because when I was first starting my career, um, I worked on a little project with her when I worked for the city of Highland Park. And, um, and I was just right out of grad school. And um, she was, I, she just really like, made me feel like a part of the team when I was just a very, very young woman starting out. So thank you, Carol, for that. Um, and my interest 
focus area has always been landscape. And so I had the opportunity to study two um, women landscape architects. Um, well, actually three um, for this recent program that Lisa and I did. So I've been really kind of into them lately. Um, and that's um, Gertrude Daimo Ku and um, the woman whose name changed so many times, who was, um, uh, her two marriages were Mary Whitmore um, Rogers. And um, the other one is May McAdams. Um, mm -hmm. So they're all very obscure. Um, but I, I usually say I, I specialize in dead people. So I <laughs> um, am very inspired what's happening today, but I'm very, very um, always immersed in uh, the past. Yes, yeah. And I guess I will, um, you know, and I, my specialty obviously is black women. And I'll say my, I'll pay my homage to Roberta Washington. Uh, she's based out of New York and she is, she is like our walking uh, Bible of black architects, right? Like she's done all of the research. She is a lot of the archives that we'll be using for first 500s, um, uh, database will be from her and her research that her team has done way back when she owns her own practice uh, and she was um, she's one of five women that we've had now as president of NOMA the National Organization of Minority Architects and that organization was founded in 1971 uh, we've had lots of male presidents very similar to AIA but she's one of five women that have um, served as president for that group and and now we're both going to be serving in leadership together while uh, for uh, the Society of Architectural Historians so I'm, I'm super super excited to work with her and again get to have this connection um, you know She's later in her career, I'm earlier in mine, and, and for her to hand the baton off, so, and, and, you know, mentor me. And I guess for this last one here, we will uh, wrap it up by um, passing the baton back over to CWA. Uh, we've talked about the women that have started it, that have really just put this, this incredible organization on the map. And obviously, there's a ton of incredible women that are, um, pushing it forward today. And so uh, I'm not sure if Nega's still on, if she could jump in and give us uh, a few, a little bit, tell us a little bit about the organization today and how people can get involved or if there's resources available for them. And sure. thank you so much, Negan, for having and hosting us. Oh, absolutely. It was a pleasure. And I have to add, it was an honor to just attend your practices and, you know, got the feel of the conversation. It was very lively and very just exciting. And I can feel the excitement tonight as well. Um, and thanks for, um, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Negan Moyer and I am currently the president of Chicago Women in Architecture. Um, it has started uh, in much the same spirit of the same amazing stories that we just heard from our panelists in 1974, following an invite from Gertrude Lemkervis, uh, uh, inviting all the women architects to, uh, from what I realized, an informal meeting, which formed the CWA. A lot of people who, whose name were mentioned today were part of uh, uh, founders of CWA and they right now uh, belong to uh, CWA Foundation, uh, which we work closely with. Um, and as far as our programming, uh, CWA mission is to raise awareness and elevate the status of women uh, in architecture industry. Uh, however, we have our membership uh, range from all uh, other industries that are parallel to architecture, such as landscape, uh, interior design, uh, lighting design, and other uh, engineering uh, professions. Uh, we provide uh, uh, career development opportunities, uh, networking, and social events, um, as, uh, as well as educational and professional development um, opportunities such as part in ARE uh, and licensure, that's a big one. And you can always get updates by uh, subscribing to our uh, mailing list in our website, cwarc.org. CWR and you can always check out our events in the events page. Uh, we have monthly forums, this one being one of them, a very successful one. 
And thank you so much. I appreciate all your attendance and uh, attention to us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. This was really fun. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. People were asking for our email addresses, and I just put mine in the um, chat. So maybe okay. you guys want to put yours in there too. So yeah, if you have ideas, even maybe some older architects, let us know. Thanks for including me, uh, Susan and everyone. And Tiara, it was great to have you lead the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for coming along with me on this ride, you guys. I, I didn't share, I we're probably kicked off of here or whatever, but um, I discovered Julia's uh, blog. She's got a blog, we didn't say that. Um, uh, when I was right, I wrote a, a piece for um, the Muse in December, and that's sort of what set this all off, that and realizing it was, a, it was the 100 year anniversary. Um, and so I just call, I cold called Julia and said, hey, <laughs> I think CWA would host us if we wanted to talk about women. And she said, call Chris. And then she sent me Lisa's uh, video, which I had wanted to go when you presented that, but it was in the middle of the day. And I had always meant to go back and, and watch it. And so then it was like, a, and then we got Tiara and I was like, I just formed a little group. <laughs> so I'm into that. So that's cool. I'm going to try and put my... Uh, it's not letting me type my address in here, but um, you can write to one of the other ones if I if I don't just get do, it. Just do it in the chat, not in the yeah, keyboard. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do, but for some reason it's not letting me type. But okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Sorry, Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.